65's Anthony Ponce is in the newsroom with late information on this really disturbing case. Anthony? Rob, as you'll see in this video, after Marcus Gaines is knocked unconscious, the only bystanders who pay any attention to him at all steal his wallet and phone. His family is now seeking damages from the 7-Eleven Corporation and the cab company and also wants help from the public. 4.19 a.m. on February 7th, the surveillance camera captures 32-year-old Marcus Gaines getting knocked out right onto State Street outside of River North 7-Eleven. After thieves pickpocket him and a few others hover around him, the bystanders walk away, leaving Gaines unconscious in the street. How can you just walk away? That angered me. That says a lot about us as, a, as humanity. Like, who are we as people? And then Marcus Gaines is allowed to lay in the street for uh, too long. Less than a minute later, the 32-year-old bartender is killed when a cab runs him over just as police arrive. For him to have to have his life cut short because of negligence was ridiculous. This happened in America. This happened in one of our cities, and it happened this year. It happened in April. I don't know what you would do. But I would like to think that I would have run to his side and I'd have done something. I would like to think that. I'd like to believe that. Sometimes we get really busy, don't we? Sometimes we get so busy and we're so focused on the stuff that we've got to get done that we ignore the needs around us. I mean, just a week ago, I, I was... I was working on this message, the Lord just reminded me of something that happened. I was driving up Clemson Road and at about 5.30, and there was a car with splashers on in the middle lane. And, um, and as I drove by, I really felt this little, like, you should stop and help. But then I started to, you know, justify myself and say, well, you know, it's busy. It's, there's a lot going on, and I've got to get whatever I, I don't even remember what I had to get done, but i got to stay focused. i got to get this accomplished. And sometimes we, we are so focused on what we have to do, and we're so busy. We just don't have the time to help others. And then I also thought, well, you know, I'm going down this line of, you know, trying to justify myself. And, you know, well, it could be dangerous, too, because if I turned around, it's really busy. You know, man, it's not safe to be in the middle lane. And, you know, somebody will, somebody will do something. You know, and I'm sure they have a phone. I'm sure they called 911. I'm sure they... They called some towing service. And then I thought, well, what could I really do? You know, maybe it's something that, that I can't really help with. And so we go through this list of, of things. I don't know what you would have done. I don't know what I would have done. If I saw Marcus laying on the side of the road, I would hope to think that I would run to his side. I would hope to think that I would just stand by him. But the reality is that no one did a thing except pickpocket him and steal his phone and his wallet and then left him for dead. What does this say about our culture? What does this say about what we have become as a human race? We have a lot of things, a lot of issues. We have a lot of things that are going on in our culture and our communities. And isn't it a good thing that our politicians are here to save us once again? Huh? Come on. I mean, come on, Donald Trump's going to, he's going to bring law and order. And Hillary Clinton, she's going to bring us all together, right? She's going to bring racial uni unity, right? Oh, wait, that was Obama. He promised that. They're going to fix us. They're going to fix our schools. They're going to fix our communities. They're going to fix everything, right? I'm not trying to bash on politicians. My point is this. Sometimes what we do is we rely on everyone else to do what really is our responsibility. We would rather an elected official fix our school problem, fix our neighborhood problem. And the reality is it's our responsibility our responsibility right if we wait on elected officials to fix our problems we're going to be waiting a long time and we're going to be really disappointed 
What about the single mom that lives two doors down from you who's doing everything she can to make enough money to pay the rent or the, the mortgage and, and keep her car running while her kids are running amok? What about her? What about the elderly man who, who lives just around the corner from you whose wife died recently? What about the kid in your neighborhood who started selling drugs? What about that neighbor whose grass looks like a jungle or the yard looks like a jungle? Have you ever thought, what's going on? What, what, what's happening? But it's easier for us to drive by and criticize, right? Or just call the HOA. Turn them in. Maybe they don't have enough money to buy a lawnmower. Maybe someone is sick in their family. But we don't know. We don't know because we're not really involved. I mean, isn't it good enough that we just keep our own noses clean, right? Isn't it good enough that we obey the law? That we do the right thing? That, that you keep your grass cut and I keep my grass cut? And isn't it good enough that we do the right thing? That we pay our HOA fees on time, right? Isn't it good enough that I raise my kids right? I mean, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And if everybody just does what they're supposed to do, this thing works, right? Isn't it, isn't it good enough? I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like it's easier for me to just roll into the house, close the blinds, and just focus on my life. I mean, I got a lot going on. The thought of getting involved in anyone else's life can, can seem insurmountable. It can, it can seem bigger than, than life. But I believe the solution to our problems, the solution to the things in our neighborhoods, in our communities, the solution to our problems in this world, it's right under our nose. And in the next six weeks, we're going to look at some really important things. This morning, I want to challenge you. I want to move you out of a comfort zone that, that maybe you've settled into. I want to challenge you in some ways. I don't want to just give you information that you can walk away and say, wow, that was a great message. I want to I see you changed. I believe that God in the next six weeks is going to change our hearts and he's going to change us as a church because the, the answer, the solution to the problems in our culture, in our communities is right there in front of us. We're going to learn the art of neighboring. If you haven't signed up for a Better Together group, I know Pastor Chuck already mentioned it, Sign up. Be a part of it. I know you're busy. I get it. I know you got a lot going on. Be a part of a group. You will not regret it. Over the next six weeks, we're going to have a great time together. You know, the story of Marcus Gaines, I heard the story a few months ago, actually. It was right after it happened. The story of Marcus Gaines reminds me of another story. And maybe when you were watching this, maybe there was something in your mind that you that reminds me of a story that Jesus told. Now, the outcome of the story was way different, the one that Jesus told, than, than what happened with Marcus. But the story that Jesus told was in Luke chapter 10, and it's the story of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37, Jesus tells this story. But before he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, I got to give you the backstory. You got to understand what's going on and why Jesus told this story. Because what he said, the backstory, is the foundation for everything that we're going to talk about over the next six weeks. This is really important. Luke chapter 10. Let me, let me, let me give you a little backstory. First of all, Jesus, uh, on multiple occasions, was confronted by religious leaders. See, because Jesus was uh, uh, accused of making it too easy for people to get to heaven or to come into the kingdom of God. And when he taught, he taught in a way where even the prostitutes and even the tax collectors, even the, the you know, what the religious people would call the scum of the earth gathered around and, and there was hope in their hearts and they were responding to his message and, and there was something that, that kind of riled the religious people up. Because they didn't think that, you know, those people should have easy access to God's kingdom. 
they thought maybe they should work a little harder for it because, by the way, they were working hard for it. I mean, they kept the law. They were very diligent about keeping the law. Very, very meticulous about it. So they got bothered by it, and they tried to trick Jesus. They tried to twist words around, and they tried to catch him so that somehow they could hang him with his words. And so on multiple occasions, it's not just Matthew or um, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37, but it's also in Matthew and Mark, Jesus is confronted by religious leaders. It's actually three different occasions. It's not the same story told from different perspectives like a lot of the Gospels do. So in three different situations, these religious leaders trying to test Jesus, trying to trick Jesus, ask him a question, hoping that he'll hang himself. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 says, On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? If somebody came up to me and said, hey, Pastor Randy, what do I need to do to get to heaven? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? I would think this person really is curious. They really want to know. He, had, he did not care about eternal life. His reason for the question was to trick Jesus and to justify his own life. So Jesus turns it around. In his wisdom, he says, well, what's written in the law? I mean, you're, you're a lawyer. You're a teacher of the law. You're one who follows the law. You're a Pharisee. So what do you think the law says? Well, you know, he was proud to, to show off what the law says. He, or, well, it says, he answers, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you'll live. So he was very proud. He knew the answer to the question. But I don't think he really understood the answer to the question. In another passage in Matthew, another situation where Jesus was confronted by a religious leader. In this story in Matthew chapter 22, it's Jesus who's asked what the greatest commandment is. Let's look at it. Verse, 20, verse 36 of Matthew 22. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law or in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I left out something there. Love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40, Jesus says, All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything in the law, everything in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, all of it, everything that you follow, Mr. Religious Leader, all, of, all the things that, that you memorize and you live by, all of it hangs on these two commandments. This is the greatest commandment. And in the, in the original language, the, the word and, you think, okay, that's simple. It's a word and. The word and means it's not a or, it's and. It's, it's both of them. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. See, the religious leaders, they were experts in the law. They knew the commandments but they ignored them. See, sometimes just because we know what's right doesn't mean we do what's right. And so they knew the commandments, but they ignored them. I wonder if we're maybe guilty of that also, of knowing what's right to do, but not doing it. I think the greatest commandment has been reduced by most Christians to a good suggestion. Just a good suggestion. But Jesus said, no, this isn't a good suggestion. All of the law and the prophets, everything, everything rests on these two commandments. And if it's that important, if it's that big of a deal, don't you think it ought to be something that we really, really do well at? Because we try to do well at a lot of things. 
this is the area where we should really focus our attention on. See, the great commandment is not an option for us. It's not a love God with all your heart or love your neighbor. See, because some of us would say, you know, man, I, I, I'm all about loving God with all my heart, but I, I don't care for people. You know who you are. I mean, you just tolerate coming to church on Sunday, right? Going to work. But it's like, I, I don't do people. And some of you, maybe, maybe you're not the religious type. You say, you know, I'm not so much about loving God, but, but I can love people. And so it's like we, we pick and choose, and it's not an or issue. It's an and, both of these. We've got to start taking the great commandment seriously. Because everything hangs on this. See, we're people of faith, aren't we? We're people that are being brought to life. We're people that believe that God loves us. We are people that even say we love God. I don't know about you if you've ever played this game with somebody that you love, maybe your kids or maybe your wife or husband or whatever, but um, I'll admit we play this game sometimes where Robin will say, I love you. Well, I love you more. Well, I love you most. Well, I love you with all my heart. We try to one-up each other, right? It's like you, wanna, you want them to know how much you love them. And the other person's, I want you to know how much I love you. You remember the first time you started, you fell in love or, or you were falling in love? I know for some of you, maybe it's been a long time, but you can remember, I'm sure, right? But uh you know, the first time that you started falling in love with someone and you tried to express to them what was inside your heart, what was growing inside of your heart, this love for them, and, and you started to feel like, man, I, I think this is the one. And you're, you're kind of adding it up and you're like, okay, I'm ready to go 100% here. I'm ready to go all, all the chips to the center, right? I'm going, ready to go all in. But before you did that, you're like, but I need to make sure they're all in too. So maybe you would ask questions. Well, yeah, how, mu how much do you love me? Or, you know, I love you better than ice cream. Well, that's a lot. You know, I mean, come on. But it's all chips. You know, I want to know, do you love me the same amount? Because you're ready to give 100%. The last thing that you want is for them to put 50% and save 50%, right? Tracking with me? I mean, nobody wants that. Who wants 100 or who wants 50% if you're given 100? Now, I remember the first time. I'll never forget the first time, actually. I told Robin that I loved her. And it was our first date. It's true. And uh, we had just gone to church. And uh, she actually took me to church with her and her, her family and and um, I don't know if it was God's love just stirring in my heart, or I'm sure it's because she was, you know, she's awesome. And, um, but uh, I think my in-laws are here. I hate to break it. We were kissing on the front porch. And, uh, yeah, we were, first date. And um, there was this intercom system that they had. I, I could swore, I think my father-in-law listened to us, but I don't, anyway, maybe not. But, uh, but anyway, we're, we're there, you know, I mean, it was just, I was feeling the love. I'm just saying, you know, I was feeling the love. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm holding her, and I just whisper, I love you. And it was silent, just like it is now. And I'm waiting. I mean, I put all the chips out there. Waiting. Waiting. And okay well I'll see you tomorrow <laughs> she loves me I'm sure of it now 26 years actually 30 years later we're, we're old babe but how do you actually gauge love how do you know I mean you you want to put all the chips out there you want them to know you love them with all your heart and you want to know it's reciprocated the exact same amount, you know? I mean, because you don't want to give 1% more than they give. You want it to be equal. How do you do, how do you gauge that? How do you gauge love? Love is, is, 
something that grows and matures inside of our heart towards others. Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. That's our goal. That's the standard. That's the mark that we have to live up to. And see, the reason God can say to us, love him. Love me with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind is because he initiated the love towards us. He didn't wait for you to love him because he'd still be waiting. He didn't wait for you to come around and, and see how much you were going to put on the line before he did. He put it all on the line for us. And so what he's saying is, I want 100% back. I don't want 50%. I don't want 60%. I don't want you to hold back a little, you know, just in case, a little contingency plan. I want 100%. That's the kind of love that I'm looking for. But how do you gauge it? How do we gauge our love for God? See, love for God cannot be gauged just by the words we say. It can't be gauged just by our worship, singing a song to Him. Just like your love for your spouse or your kids can't be gauged just by the words that you say. It can't be gauged or measured just by the intent of our heart. Because, I mean, hey, we all have good intentions, right? I mean, we intend to do things, but we don't follow through all the time. So it's not about just intentions. It's not about just the words we say. And it's not about our one-dimensional approach to loving God. Let me explain what I mean by that. As we tend to love God in a one-dimensional approach or one-dimensional way. See, the intellect says, I love God with all of my mind. They memorize scripture. They, they learn about God. They dig deep and they're their faith has deep roots that, that are, you know, they understand in a deep way and is very much uh, focused on what they know. The emotional person loves God with all of their heart. They're passionate. They're expressive. I mean, they shout. They dance. They love to express themselves. Because they connect with God emotionally. And the disciplined person loves God with all their soul. That's the person who, who loves routine. They love rituals. I mean, they are closer to God when they're doing their devotions at 10 o'clock each day. Some people love God with the strength of their mind, but the weakness of their emotions. They're very intellectually connected with God, but very emotionally disconnected from Him. Some people love God emotionally, but with the weakness of their mind. They're very passionate, very uh, out, you know, expressive, but very shallow in what they know about God. I'm proud to be a spirit-filled church. Proud that Vive is a spirit-filled church, that we believe in the gifts of the spirit. But sometimes churches that are spirit-filled and spirit-led tend to be very shallow when it comes to doctrine and understanding, but very emotional. Some people love God that way, and they connect emotionally, but they're very weak in their intellect and in, in, in knowing God's word. Some people have the strength of the will, but the weakness of emotion. See, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. It's not one or the other. It's all of them together. And sometimes we tend to love God, though, in a one-dimensional way because it fits our personality. It fits who we are. If I'm an intellect, that's how I really connect with God. But I'm disconnected emotionally or if I'm an emotional person I'm you know like it's all about the way you feel right you got to feel God's presence 
Who, who cares if you, if you know actually what the Bible says? You don't have to open it. Just feel it, brother. Right? Come on. Or about the rituals and doing the routines and doing all the disciplines. But it's all of this. And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. This is 100%. It's probably safe to say none of us are there. Because we tend to love God according to what's easiest for us. And this is the point that Jesus was making with the religious leader. And this religious person. This is the point he was making with him. Is that to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. It's not just about what's going on with you following the law, but what about your neighbor? See, because he knew the command, but he wasn't following the command. I grew up in a religious home, learning about God, knew about God, not a whole lot, but a little bit, but a, a religious home. And I grew up, and maybe some of you same way, with the idea that religion is a personal thing. It's something between you and God. You don't really discuss it with others. And I remember in high school, a guy actually talking to me about Jesus, and it really freaked me out because it was like, hey, we'll talk about this stuff outside of church, you know? And I didn't say to him, this is a personal thing, but, but it very much, you know, that, that's my approach, was it was about personal it was, about, it was between me and God. And maybe, maybe that's your approach, that you think your relationship with God, your love for God is really just between you and him. See, Jesus taught that our faith is connected with loving others and loving God. It's not an or situation. It's an and. The two are connected. So your faith, my faith, is connected with loving others and loving God. And that was Jesus' point to the religious leader. When you ignore your neighbor, your love becomes just a religion. See, when you and I ignore our neighbor, when you and I ignore others around us, then our love for God just becomes a religion. And yeah, it is a personal thing. It's just between you and God. But that's not our goal, is it? Is to be good at our religion? I don't want to be religious. I want to grow in this love that God's put inside of my heart. I want to grow in that. But if I'm going to grow in that love, if I'm going to grow in my love for God, then I've got to grow in my love for others. Your, your love for God is measured and matured by your love for others. Let me say it again. It's up on the screen. Your love for God is measured and matured by your love for others. It's very connected. Now I know that that makes some people uncomfortable because it's like, man, I, I, I want to do this God thing. I want to grow in my love for God, but I don't like people. Right? No, don't raise your hand. I know who you are. I don't like people. Why do I have to love people? Can't, can't I just focus on God? Can't I just let this be a personal thing? See, something happens when you and I love our neighbors. And next week, we're going to learn who our neighbor is. But something happens when you and I love our neighbors. Our heart begins to change. Our heart begins to be transformed. Because it's hard to measure. It's hard to gauge love. We can all say, oh, yeah, I love God with all my heart. Love him. Yeah. Look, I'm reading his word. I quote you scripture. Woohoo! hallelujah. Did my devotions yesterday. I mean, we can, it's hard for us to gauge our love for God. But maybe, maybe our love for God is connected. And I'm being a little sarcastic. Catch that? Maybe our love for God is connected with how we love others. And maybe that means we got to start doing a little better at loving others. See, the task of loving our neighbor, I believe, is just the right thing that you and I need to mature 
our love for God. I believe it's just the right thing, and I believe that's why God put the two together. And that's why I believe the religious leader, why Jesus turned it around on him and said, hmm, what are you doing? Because he said, all right, you've answered correctly. Now do this and live. Do this. And you are alive. But see, he struggled. He struggled with that second part, just like a lot of people do. A lot of Christians struggle with that second part. It says the religious leader tried to justify himself. And we'll hear next week. He says, who's my neighbor? Sometimes we try to justify ourselves. See, our neighbor is not determined by who is easiest to love. It's not determined by who we want to love. Our neighbor's determined by something else. We'll learn about that next week. Got to come back. But God places people around us. And he's really, he's, he's really thorough in, in placing the right people in our lives. But he, he places people around us who are sometimes difficult to love. They're challenging. They're messy. You just want to wring their neck. You don't want to love them. I mean, you just want to kill them. But he puts you in those places. Sometimes it's hard to love them. They're not the people we would pick. They're not the easiest. Maybe it's the single mom that lives two doors down whose kids are running amok. They keep banging their basketball against your house. They're driving in your yard. They're dropping trash in your yard. I mean, the list goes on. I don't know what your, what your neighbor kids do. Maybe it's the elderly man that lives down the street or around the corner who you have nothing in common with, or at least you think you don't. Or it's that teenage drug dealer. Cars just keep driving by, and it's easier for you to just call 911 and make sure he gets locked up. I mean, that's the solution. That fixes everything. Or it's that neighbor with the yard that's like a jungle, right? God puts us in places, and he surrounds us with people that sometimes are not the easiest to love. Marcus Gaines would be alive today if someone just stood by him. If someone just took the time to come over to him, and stand there. He'd be alive. What if we took the great commandment seriously? What if it became a commandment instead of a suggestion? What if you and I really started loving our neighbors like we love ourselves? And what if we took the time starting this week and just stood by someone? What if we saw loving others, loving our neighbor as God's plan to mature his love that he put inside of our heart, to mature it to 100%? What if we started seeing it that way? So your love for God is measured and matured by your love for others. neighborhood of Chicago, not too different from where we're at right now. They're set an abandoned house in disrepair with high grass and weeds all over the place. And eventually, this house went up for auction due to back taxes. Of course, someone bought the house, and when they took possession of the house and went in to start cleaning it out, they found something that was absolutely horrifying. Rather than just finding a house in disrepair, they found a man by the name of Adolf Steck. 
Mr. Steck had apparently died of natural causes by sitting in his reading chair. Right next to him was a newspaper. In 2001, there was a newspaper dated 1997. No friends, no relatives, and no neighbors had even noticed. How is it possible that somebody can die and no one notice for four years? stand with me. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment and just close your eyes? Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what? I want to experience God's love. I want God's love to grow inside of my heart. I need His forgiveness. I need that love inside of me. Maybe you're not in a relationship with him today, but you know what? You're saying, I want to open my heart to him. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to pray for you, and I'd love to see you take that step. It's a simple step. The work has already been done. It just takes you pushing all your chips to the middle, saying, you know what? I'm going to trust God. He's already pushed all his chips. If you're here this morning and that's you, you say, man, I, I just want to experience God's love. Would you slip up your hand so that I can pray for you? I'm not going to ask you to do anything else. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just between me, you, and God. Anyone else? Just between me, you, and God. We're going to pray in just a moment. Would you just keep your hand raised as I pray? Father, I thank you for faith that is stirring I thank you, Lord, most of all, God, for your love that you poured out on us. You expressed love for us first. While we were away from you, while we didn't care about you, we weren't even thinking about you, while we were sinners, you died for us, Jesus. You demonstrated your love for us. You didn't just talk about it. But you reached down. You reached down into the deepest, darkest places. And you picked us up. If you raised your hand this morning, would you pray this simple prayer with me? Would you say, Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life. I surrender to you. God, fill my heart with love. Help me to love others. And help me to grow in this relationship with you. Jesus name In Jesus name amen amen can we pray together everyone father thank you for your love and I pray Lord this right now God that the things that we heard the great commandment Lord that we would move from it being a good suggestion to really what you intended it to be and it is the greatest commandment it's the thing that all of the law, all of the prophets, all of it hinges on that. All of it hangs on that one thing. Loving you with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. God, help us to do that. Help us not to be guilty like the religious leader was of just knowing and trying to justify ourselves, but help us, God to step out of our comfort zones, to trust you, and to let that love that's inside of our hearts be an overflow to the people around us. God, help us this week. Help us today to just come alongside of someone and stand with them.
Changing one, a changing one. You who was and is to come, your promise sure. You will not let go. See, there is hope. There is hope in the promise of the cross. You gave. 